Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. Hope everybody has gotten off to a great start. Uh, here we are. This is going to be the second installment in the uh, second installment part two of the disintegration of the black family, a gender war and an identity crisis. Uh, this is part two of an ongoing series where we're going to delve into a very important element and component of our struggle, of our inability to achieve true progress in the way of liberation and power. Uh, we talk a lot about it. We uh, lament a lot about it. We point fingers. We love to have these philosophical debates and intellectual masturbation sessions uh, to prove who's the smartest, who knows the most. Uh, everybody wants to claim the role of a leader uh, in the community, uh, but very few are executing the responsibilities. And then one must ask if you have such an exceptional <clears throat> race of people, why is it that there is so little process? Why is it that we are incessantly at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder? Why is it that we cannot seem to uh, achieve any political clout and power to move policies and statutes and laws in our favor? Why is it that we are in a situation where we are seeing the wealth gap widen despite all of our gifts, all of our talents, all of our skills, and all that we lend so heavily to society. And we must have an understanding of the law of cause and effect. We must have an understanding of sourcing and understanding and developing an awareness of where your problems originate. The genesis of the problem is where you have to be in order to solve the problem. Talking about symptoms, talking about circumstances, talking about uh, uh, circumstantial situations uh, do nothing to solve the problem. I have said this for years that if you don't have an understanding of how things work, you have no capacity to change the direction, the reality, the situation, or the circumstance. You have to have an understanding of how things work. And because we lack that understanding, because we are willfully ignorant and blissfully uh, misinformed, we are caught up in this vortex of discomfort and oppression and depression and every other kind of eschen you can possibly imagine because we refuse to invest in an understanding. I have been conducting scientific research uh, for the purpose of discovery uh, for three decades. And what I have uncovered is multitudinous machinations, multitudinous issues and problems, and most of them are socially engineered. When I say socially engineered, I mean that someone somewhere decided that this would be a great way to deal with us, and they came up with this policy, with this practice, with this plan, all these different things that we face on a regular basis isn't happenstance. We aren't where we are because we're lazy. We aren't where we are because we don't have the ability to win. We are we are where we are because those who have power don't want to relinquish it. We're where we are because we are the greatest threat and they understand it better than we understand it. So they have developed uh, means and ways of manipulating, controlling us, misguiding us, misleading us and we have participated in it at a great level let me tell you something black i mean white supremacy racism all of these different uh right white racial caste systems that work against us are only effective because we participate the moment that we stop participating and contributing to our own demise the moment that the system grows weak we have to learn how to build how to grow how to develop and we have lost that before I get started, 
on this brief uh we got probably maybe 10 minutes but before i do i want to remind you that we are in the middle of a fundraising campaign to deal with uh mental health issues uh domestic violence issues intimate partner violence intimate partner homicide uh a number of different extreme situations in which we are seeing mental health uh become more and more pervasive within our community with less and less resources and less and less means of how we can deal with it. We have to develop a way to deal with that. And I'm conducting the research for, for the for the sake of policy and performance. And I need your support. I need your support to continue the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage initiative. If we don't properly socialize young black males, we are going to lose the war in developing strong black men. It's that simple. And I can go on and on with the stuff that we've done over the last 30 years that we continue to do, but we need your support. Look in the description box and give. Uh, we can talk all day long until we get to the point where we are ready to finance our own revolution. We are spitting in the wind. Uh, so here we go. We're going to talk about this. Is, um, this subtopic uh, is in what chapter is this? I guess so. now, the subtopic is the death of the black family. I'm only going to read two paragraphs. I'm going to uh, elaborate on those two paragraphs briefly, and this will be the end of uh, part two. And I'll be coming back with part three on tomorrow or the next day. The death of the black family. The problem is that the black family is currently on life support. When I began to process the process of um, writing the influence of cognitive distortions on the social mobility and mental health of African Americans, uh, which was basically a dissertation of my findings and research in the same area, I had no idea just how deep it would take me. When you spend a significant portion of your life studying the decline of your people and attempting to develop some type of response mechanism to counter it, it can be easy to develop an arrogance based on what you think you know. What I found when researching the writing, researching and writing this in-depth work was, the more I learned about the complex nature of the dilemma my people are facing, the more I realized that I have only scratched the surface. Second paragraph, when examining the impact that co cognitive distortions have had <clears throat> Uh, on the reality of blacks in America, it is also necessary to identify and anatomize the origin of these distorted, invasive uh, thought processes. In doing so, I've discovered multitudinous uh, schemes and machinations that were specifically formulated for the purpose of destroying the black family. I want to focus what I'm talking about here. We're talking about the... Uh, the disintegration of the black family, but I want to focus on cognitive distortions. What are cognitive distortions? The distortions of how we think, the literally warping of an idea, the warping of a narrative, the warping of a belief, the warping of paradigms. Socially, there are socially acceptable paradigms. There are progressive paradigms. The paradigm is simply the lens through which you view life. It is the construct that governs your behaviors, governs your expectations, not only about yourself, but about the world around you. When you grow up from up until the age of roughly about seven years old, your brain functions in, uh, is in a constant state of theta. Your brain waves are in theta. When your brain waves are in theta, they are open and highly suggestive, uh, open to, uh, to suggestions. So they are literally downloading. So children up until the age of seven are developing their paradigms through which they're going to live their life. They're learning what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what people think of them, what they think of themselves, how they're going to approach the life, what they are allowed to do versus what other people do, and so many other things. So this is the t best time to start racially socializing young children. Why? Because they need to develop a sense of, a, of an identity that is associated with strength because everything they're being fed outside of the home is placing blackness in a place of weakness, in a place of subservience, in a place of uh, antisocial uh, behavior, in a place of intellectual inferiority all of these notions are suggestive in almost every environment that they enter into even the academic environment where it is automatically assumed that white students are more intellectually superior to black students which we have proven not to be the case 
but it doesn't mean that it's still not a narrative being pushed. And what we have to understand is it's not simply enough to sit up and say, well, this is what we know. If we haven't developed our own narrative, our own means by which we can effectively inculcate the ideas of how exceptional we are into the minds and the psyches of our young children in a way that we can then insulate that idea, insulate that narrative, cover that narrative, protect that narrative, and then allow it to take anchor and root in their mind, in their thinking, in their behavior, in their aspirations, in their dreams, in their visions, so that they are now thinking not to be accepted, not to be hired, not to be liked, not to be approved of, but to walk in the own awareness of who they are as individuals and as collectives because of how they are built, how they are made, and why they're exceptional, why they're beautiful, why they're smart, why they're capable. And then we are able, after a certain amount of time of inculcating and developing this idea, we're able to release them into a world that's inherently hostile towards them. And we know they will be able to not only compete, but win. But we have to sit up and be willing to do that. The distortions that are being pushed are being pushed from almost every mechanism. It's in the media. It's in the songs. It's in uh, the commercials. Uh, it's in academia, and 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 many times it's in the home. There's literally a uh, uh, conversation and discussion that is reflective of a grand social idea or narrative that whites are superior, blacks are inferior, b whites are beautiful, blacks are ugly, whites have good hair, blacks have bad hair, and all of these different narratives are being pushed, and at every when every when each particular narrative is accepted it's a blow to the self image it's a blow to self esteem which is a blow to self confidence and in 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 that means it means i'm less likely to go out and take risks to do things and achieve things and become what I'm capable of becoming. And it's because I was not properly anchored. The people who had the power to be the label givers in my life did not label me properly. They told me I should probably not try that. I wasn't good enough. They told me I was only going to be able to do this. They told me that I was dumb, that I was stupid. It's a lot of that. Stop that in your home. Take certain words. The word can't doesn't belong in the vocabulary of a child. The word dumb and stupid do not belong in the vocabulary of a child. Vocabulary of a child. Ignorant, crazy. All of these things that we tend to call our, call our kids. We need to remove those. We need to replace those with words of empowerment, words of uh, force. We need to be talking about you're capable, you're smart, you're intelligent, you're beautiful, you're handsome. All of these things that are going to work in a diametric force against and opposed to all of the negative rhetoric that they're going to have to face the moment they walk outside of the doors of the house. We have to be aware. The identity crisis isn't an accident. It is the perpetuation of an idea that you have nothing. Italians come here. They are Italian Americans. They are not Italian Americans simply because they know somewhere over on the other side of the ocean that's this place called Italy and more than likely they're from there. They can tell you where from Italy they're from. They can tell you their line. And because we don't have that, because we were likely, uh, you know, sixth generation uh, uh, on this side of the pond, and there is no direct connection to where we are originating from, we have to see ourselves in a new way. This is the uniqueness of being a foundational American or a descendant of a slave is that you are coming out of an oppressed reality. In other words, when we studied epigenetics, the slavery experience didn't just create people who were mentally uh, subdued, which is a part of capturing and subjugating someone. It's not the shackles, it's the mentality. But in the subjugation and the oppression that came, it also became a writing in the DNA that literally stress, trauma, a natural fear of certain things 
in certain times is now a part of the DNA. You have to rewrite the code. You've got to know how to reprogram code. Know your sequence isn't changing, but your coding is changing. And there's a difference. The sequence is the same. But the coding has to do also not as much as with the numerical coding that's written in your DNA that determines your eye color, your height, uh, your temperament, and, and your skin tone, and all this other stuff that comes from parents, but also your, 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 your level of belief in yourself, your level of confidence, your level of fear, natural uh, apprehension, uh, natural hypervigilance. All of these things we know now can literally be passed down through procreation. And if it can be passed down through procreation, then we can literally g generationally perpetuate inferiority, generationally uh, perpetuate uh, substandard expectations and it's not because we don't have the capacity it's because capacity is only fulfilled when explored you will only fulfill your potential when you explore your potential when you seek it out you discover it you activate it you actualize it you fulfill it that is what has to happen and unfortunately that's not what happening that's not what what is happening with the vast majority and as i said in part one one of the biggest problems we have is that those of us who have had some level of success those of us who have gotten out there and been able to navigate this world and realize some things that the average person in our race will never experience, we have uh, been in some way rewarded. And it's the reward that provides the comfort and it's the comfort that makes us unwilling to step out and be a part of the solution. Why? Because the moment I become an enemy of those who I believe are setting me up to experience this, I believe and I understand that a level of discomfort that I'm not willing to deal with comes with it. And so it takes a very special person to sit up and say, I don't care what happens, I'm going to be a part of the answer. I'm going to be a part of the solution. That will, be, that, that will never be anything greater than my purpose to be the best I can first and foremost for my family, second and foremost for my community and my race and then from my country and all this other stuff. But I got to first make sure the people I'm most related to and connected to are going to be okay. And that means I have to be willing to go the distance. I have to be willing to get outside of the box. I have to be willing to take on the challenges. This identity crisis uh, is also a reason we're dealing with the gender war. This is no accident. This is a purposeful, intentful push to write a narrative that highlights the worst of our worst, male and female, puts them front and center, writes them as the code X for who we are, and we have bought into it. We have bought into the idea that our black men are trifling with actually the statistics show that we are the best fathers, we are the best husbands, we are the best providers with what we have. Now, we don't have as much as they have, but we spend more time with our kids than they do. We literally take care of our kids even after divorce than they do, but that's not the image they're putting out. And the only time you're going to ever see us is when we're doing something wrong. So we only get the imagery of the worst of the worst. When there's a good man doing what a good man should, you don't see him. You don't see him because he isn't representative of what we want the narrative to say. The same thing with our women. We have some very unbelievably, exceptionally, extraordinary black women. What do we see? The loud ones, the promiscuous ones, promiscuous ones, the ones who want to sit up and lead with their body instead of their brain. All those things that the average black man isn't even turned on by. We keep saying we're not turned on about it, but they keep pumping it. That's literally a study going on right now. I'm a part of it. A lot of the stuff that my sisters are doing to their bodies, not just the BBLs, but facial surgery as well, the la all that stuff, the vast majority of our brothers are not with it. Now, will we accept it? Yes, we love our sisters. Will we even sit up and invest in it? Yes, we don't want the we don't want the smoke. But if you give us a place where we can talk and there's no ramifications, meaning I ain't got to deal with the attitude, I ain't got. We'll tell you we don't want all that. We just want you, and we're gonna love on you. We're gonna protect you. We're gonna provide for you. We're gonna cover you. We're gonna speak power into your life. We're gonna do all those things. And what we need you to do is speak back to us, lean into us. But that's not 
the message that's being sent. There's a message that cultivates literal vitriol and hatred amongst us by pointing out things that doesn't represent the vast majority. So now we see the negative side and the neg I mean the extreme negativity of the other side in everyone we run into. We, we, we come to expect the worst instead of seeing and looking for the best. And it's not by accident. We have got to become more aware of how this works. We've got to become more aware of how uh, the use of pro propaganda works. We've got to become more aware of how it's being used and how the narratives are being written so that we can write our own narratives we can tell our own story we can tell it our way we can sit up and and be forthcoming and reveal the power that's within us and we are going to have to do it from an internal endogenous type um, play we can't depend on the oppressor to liberate us we cannot depend on those who benefit from our financial influidity to all of a sudden empower us financially this has to be something we do ourselves we can't as uh, uh, as as malcolm uh brother malcolm said we can't expect our enemies to educate our children there are so many different things that are at play that we are literally losing because we are literally foolishly uh, expecting something beyond what should naturally be expected. And we've got to reprogram our minds, reprogram our expectations, reprogram our focus and how we move, how we see things. And this begins early. That's why I've constantly pushed socialization. Why? Because that's where you, tr you literally hand a young black male and a young black female their identity. It normally happens in the home and it is best in a home where there's both masculine and feminine energy. And we are missing the point. Look, I'm not going to carry too much. I don't want to go too long because there's also this thing we don't want anything that doesn't entertain to go over three or four minutes we can't take any real true substance for any pro prolonged period of time it's boring uh we're going to entertain ourselves right into complete destruction but i'm going to go ahead and shut it down here remember what i said in the beginning if you believe in the work i'm doing if you want to see some things change if you want to support black man lead if you want to support the research we're doing on mental health and the lack of resources and how it's impacting the home how it's impacting homelessness how it's impacting incarceration these are the next steps in understanding and discovering and creating new opportunities if you believe in, or in what we're doing, if you want to see progress beyond the yap yap and the yada yada, show some love and show some support. It doesn't happen any other way. It does not happen any other way. There's no way around it. You have got to get in the mindset of doing something beyond just talking. And that's what we've been doing for 30 years. And that's what I'm going to continue to do until I take my last breath. I'm asking you to take the ride with me. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. This is part two. I've got part three coming to you. We're going to keep this thing going. There are going to be some points where we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about some lighter things and make it all connect. But I need to lay the foundation of what we're dealing with here. And on that note, I'm out of here. Again, thank you guys for lending me your time.